How many of you this morning, as you were driving into church, were paying attention to your surroundings? We don't get a beautiful morning like this every once in a while. What a, I mean, just a gorgeous, gorgeous morning to come to church. And our faith in the God of creation is not blind without reason. As believers, we don't need to fear looking at the evidence around us. Alan Rex Sandage is one of the leading observation cosmologists in the world, pretty much by everyone who, who believes in that kind of thing. He spent most of his career quantifying the expanse of the universe, finding quasars and solar systems, looking at what can be seen through the most powerful telescopes in the world. And when he was 60 years of age, he spoke at a conference in Dallas, Texas on science and faith. And everyone thought they knew which side of the argument that he would be on because he was known to be an atheist. But in a talk on the Big Bang Theory, Sandage said that at the age of 50 years of life, he had come to believe in God, and soon thereafter that, he became a Christian. Now this produced a Big Bang all across the auditorium, if you can imagine. And Sandage was asked, can a person be a scientist and a Christian at the same time? And here's how he answered that question. Yes, as I've said before, the world is too complicated in all of its parts and interconnections to be due to chance alone. The very first book in our Bibles is called Genesis. And Genesis means beginnings. Beginnings. It tells of the beginning of the world, the beginning of mankind, the beginning of sin, the beginning of a sacrifice for sins, and the beginning of God's special relationship with the people that he's created. Someone had once said that it's nearly impossible to fully understand the rest of the Bible unless we understand the first 12 chapters of the book of Genesis. Those chapters are the foundation of the rest of what the Bible is all about. That's why we're going to spend the next several weeks looking at the book of Genesis. But I want you to notice the very first words in Genesis. This is really all you need to know. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. Before anything else happened, there was God. The scripture doesn't start out saying that in the beginning the earth was full without form and void, or in the beginning before the sun and the solar system existed, or in the beginning in a land far, far away. It simply says, in the beginning, God. You see, many people get the mistaken impression that the Bible is geocentric. Geo-earth, as in geography. In other words, they believe the Bible is centered on the earth and mankind. That's only partially true. The Bible is actually theocentric. Theo is a word for God. Theocentric, theo-God. It's God-centered. In fact, in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, we're told this, In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed, but you will remain the same, and your years will never end. Everything in Scripture is built not so much around the earth or even you or I, but around God. Now, why is that important? Why is it important that the Bible starts out saying, in the beginning, God? 
Well, first, because God formed the earth. He created it. He owns it. It belongs to him. Now, we may be the actors on the grand stage of life, but God owns the stage. He owns the props. He owns us. Everything that you can see and touch and feel in this world belongs to God. You know, there was once a group of scientists that got together and they decided that they no longer needed God. One of them said, God, we've decided we no longer need you. We can even clone people and make body parts, so we just don't need you anymore. So God listened patiently, and he said, let's have a man-making contest just like in the days of Adam. The scientist agreed, and he bent down to grab himself a handful of dirt, and God smiled and said, no, 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 you get your own dirt. <laughs> it's all God's. Everything is his. And once we figure that out, everything in Scripture begins to make sense. But you have to start with God. The second reason that Genesis starts out saying, in the beginning, God, is because without God, nothing else makes sense. Nothing has purpose. Nothing has real value. You take God out of the equation and you end up with an empty, meaningless universe. You know, about 50 years ago, there was a man named Hugh Moorhead. And he wrote about several famous people. People who were accomplished and had made something really significant of their lives. And he asked if they would help him by telling what they thought of the following question. What is the purpose of life? Just think about how you would answer that question. What is the purpose of life? Isaac Asimov wrote back, as far as I can see, there is no purpose to life. Arthur Clarke, the author of 2001, wrote back, I'm afraid I have no concrete ideas of the purpose of life. A famous American philosopher by the name of Thomas Nagel said, I'm afraid the meaning of life eludes me. Comedian Fred Allen replied, I say life is a slow walk down a long hall that gets darker as you approach the end. And with a sense of resignation, Joseph Heller, author of Catch-22, wrote, I have no answers to the meaning of life, and I no longer want to search for any. These were famous people. These were people who had arrived at their respective fields of endeavor. They were successful in this world, but they were apparently people without God in their world. And because of that, they had no answer to the purpose of life. So how would you answer that question? If somebody came up to you out of the blue and they said, what is the purpose of life? How would you respond? You see, it's God that creates value in this world and in us. Without God, you're left with nothing of intrinsic value in the world. Everything you see becomes a mere accident, a chance, a collection of atoms and molecules. There's no plan and there's no purpose. But once you place God back into the picture... Life suddenly has value. King David wrote in Psalm 40 verse 5, The things that you plan for us, no one can recount to you. Were I to speak of and tell of them, they would be too many to declare. In the New Testament, in Ephesians 2.10, God tells us that once we become his people, once we become Christians, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Over and over and over again, in the Bible, God tells us that we are valuable and that he has a plan and purpose for our lives. But if God isn't in your life, you don't have that. And life becomes an empty void. It's God that gives value to life.
So this is a $20 bill. How many of you would be pleased if I gave you this $20 bill? Raise your hand. You know, it would be more effective if it was a $100 bill. Then I'd have more of you maybe raising your hand. But what if I tore it? Would you still want this $20 bill? Ethan, Ethan would. Well, what if I, what if I crumpled this $20 bill up? Would you still want it? What if I threw this $20 bill on the ground and started stomping on it? Would you still want it? Yes, of course you would. Well, too bad I'm not giving it to you. <laughs> Actually, that $20 bill belongs to Emmy. It's not mine. <laughs> so why is that $20 bill worth $20? Is the paper worth $20? Is the ink on that $20 bill worth $20? Is it that little plastic strip they put on the inside of it. Is it worth $20? So if the paper, the ink, and that little plastic strip aren't worth $20, what makes that bill worth $20? It's worth that much because the U.S. government says it's worth that much. And to verify that bill's value, the federal government puts its image on that bill. So how do I know as a person I have value? Because God puts his image on me. God has placed his image on you. Just look at the text. Look at Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Wonder of wonder, you are created in God's image. You have intrinsic value for, the, for that reason alone. You are worth a great deal. So in other words, what you think you are shapes who you are. If you think you were born a loser, if you think that you have no purpose and no value in life, that's how you're going to live. But if you realize and you understand that you have intrinsic value, you will live up to that image. Are you following me? And God says that you have value because his image is tattooed on your very soul. But that's not the only reason you and I have value. God tells us that everything in the world was created by him for us. Look at verse 26. God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. That's our commission. We are stewards of this world. And it's been placed in our hands to take care of God's creation. No other part of creation was entrusted with this responsibility. And no other part of creation even thinks about preserving the world around them. God gave that responsibility to us. And who would understand that better than a bunch of farmers? God gave that responsibility to us. That's how much God values us. He created us for, he created this world for us and he gave us stewardship over the entire earth. And Genesis 1 not only tells me that God created this world just for you and I, but it goes into great detail to show the lengths that God went to prepare this world for us. It's the only known planet in the universe with the advantages for life that ours has. Our planet, our planet Earth, exists in what's called the Goldilocks zone. Not too close to the sun and not too far away. For example, did you know that if the Earth was one degree closer to the sun, we'd fry? If we were one degree further away from the sun, we'd freeze. 
If the moon was any closer to the earth or any larger, the tides would destroy our coastline. If the moon was any smaller or further away, oceans would, would die from a lack of nutrient movement. If our distance from the planet Jupiter were any greater, asteroids and comets would pepper the earth. But if we were any closer to Jupiter, our orbit would be unstable. If the Earth's surface gravity was any stronger, it would retain too much ammonia and methane and we wouldn't be able to breathe. If, if it were any weaker, Earth's atmosphere would lose too much water and we wouldn't have the necessary liquid to survive. If the Earth's crust was any thicker, it would absorb too much of our oxygen and we wouldn't be able to breathe. If it were any thinner, the earth would move and shake under our feet and life would really be impossible. If our oceans were half of their present size, we'd receive only a quarter of the rainfall that we do now. If it were just an eighth larger than it is right now, we'd get four times the annual precipitation that we do now and our Earth, our planet Earth, would be a vast, uninhabitable swamp. And I could go on and on and on about the uniqueness of this planet that God has created for us. You know, there are scientists who believe that there are planets out there with the ability to sustain life but the very fragile balance and intricateness of its various parts makes our planet such a good place that life is virtually impossible to duplicate. No matter how many billions of planets there might be out there in the universe, it is statistically improbable that any of them would match the life-giving perfection that this simple planet Earth that we live on has. And that's why Genesis is so specific about the care that God took in preparing the world for mankind. It just had to be just right or life couldn't exist. One man compared it to this. He compared it to a time that he decided that he wanted to raise fish. And he said the first thing we did was go out and buy an aquarium. We also had to get supplies, stones, aerator, filter system, and a background for the aquarium. We took everything home, put the aerator in, the filter system, and filled the bottom of the aquarium with rocks. Put the background on it, and we put water in it. And then we went out and bought some fish, and brought them home, put them in the aquarium, and sat and watched them all die. Why did they die? Because the water wasn't properly treated with certain chemicals. The fish needed an environment that would support their life. In the same way, God was very particular on how he built our environment on this planet. If it wasn't just so, without the proper combination of chemicals and minerals and gases, we'd never survive. Now one last thing caught my attention here. What did God create on the first day? I don't think I've ever noticed this. What did God create on the first day? Light. But this wasn't the sun and moon kind of light. God created the sun, moon, and stars three days later. This light was a divine light. A light that came directly from God to light the world. But this is what's odd. This light was the only thing that God created on the first day. And I thought to myself, well, why just create light? Why not do something else? You know, if I go into a dark room, I don't turn on the light and leave. I, I turn on the light to see what's there. The light is only a tool for me to use to do what I really came into that room to pick up. Turning on the light is never the primary reason that I flip on the switch. But here in Genesis chapter 1, it's like God entered the room and he specifically came in to turn on the light. He turned on that divine light 
And he essentially turned around and he left the room. And that's all that he did on the first day. Why? Why would he do that? Well, because turning on the light was why God came into the room. You see, God wasn't just creating this world for us. From the very first day of creation, God intended to send us a message of his plan from the very beginning of eternity. And what was that message? Well, let me set the stage here for you. Jesus tells us in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And we're told a little bit earlier in John's gospel, in chapter 1, verse 4, and Jesus was life, and that life was the light of man. Jesus was the light of the world. But what did Jesus have to do to give us that light? He died for our sins. He was buried. And he rose from the grave. We just finished celebrating that last Sunday. And when he rose from the, ga the grave, Jesus conquered death. And he gave us hope of eternal life. Now guess which day of the week Jesus rose from the grave and conquered death. Do you see the connection? The first day. The first day. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. When God created the world, he lit the world with his divine light. There was no other light for the world. Without that divine light, the world was lost in complete darkness. And without that divine light, there would be no life on this planet that we call Earth. In the same way, Jesus is the divine light. Without his light, this world is lost in darkness. And he is the only light that can give us the hope of life. And it is his light that changes the lives of people who are plunged into the darkness of sin. You know, there was once a woman named Rose Crawford. And she had been blind for 50 years. And then she had an operation and when the doctor took off her bandages, she said, I can't believe it. And she wept because it was the first time in her life that she could actually see. She saw this dazzling, beautiful world full of colors and form. The amazing thing about her story was that for 20 years of her, her life, that blindness would have been unnecessary. She didn't know that there had been surgical techniques that had been developed that an operation could have restored her vision at the age of 30. Her doctor said she just figured that this would, there was nothing that could be done for her condition. Much of her life could have been different. And the Bible tells us that life without Jesus Christ, life without Jesus, the light of the world, there's darkness, complete darkness. We understand that we've failed, that we live sinful lives, and at times we can feel worthless and that life is without value. But once we figure out that something can be done, that Jesus can remove our shame and hopelessness, why would we want anything different? Jesus says you don't have to live like that. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And I think the question for many of us is this. Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus is the only true light of the world? And if so, do you care enough about your neighbors 
and friends and family members to tell them what God wants for their lives. God's still in the creating business. But he chooses to do it now through his son Jesus Christ spiritually. If you are in Jesus Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. May we pray.